As faculty, staff, and students, we spend much of our time here dealing with exams, homework, lectures, budgets, personnel, and other topics. Doing the things that are required to keep the university and our careers running. This talk series, What Matters to Me and Why, is a chance to take a few minutes each month to stop and take a bit of a break from our usual frenetic activities. And every month we have the opportunity to hear from someone who helps to shape UCI through his or her daily activities. The person gives a short informal talk followed by ample time for questions and discussion. There's no prescribed topic. We simply ask the speakers what matters to you and why. And then we let them take that wherever it goes in an authentic and frank manner. The series provides a forum for speakers to talk about their values, beliefs, and motivations, and perhaps share how these have shaped their personal experiences and been shaped by their personal experiences. And we encourage them to include both the highs and lows that they've experienced along the way. The hope is to strengthen the bonds between faculty and staff and students who live and teach and work here, and to celebrate both the diversity of this community and the common values that bind us together. Now, as I said, the series is a monthly series. It takes place on the second Wednesday of the month, um, except for uh, December and June, I think. Um, our next speaker is Stephen Tucker. He is the conductor of the UCI Symphony Orchestra, and he will be speaking on Wednesday, February 14th, Valentine's Day. So there's music to go with that. It's appropriate. Um, but now let me introduce Rebecca Thompson. She's a graduate student in the Department of Psychology and Social Behavior and a member of the What Matters to Me and Why Organizing Committee, and she's going to introduce today's speaker. Hi, everybody. Uh, like Clara said, my name is Rebecca Thompson, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Joanna Ho is Professor of Accounting in the Paul Mirage School of uh, Business here at UCI, um, where she has been for over 20 years. Um, she holds both a BBA and an MBA from the National Taiwan University and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. And her research focuses on corporate governance, performance valuations, and compensation systems, and pr improving performance with technology, to name but a few topics um, that she has worked on. Um, and she has published this work in many esteemed journals in her field, including Accounting Horizon, Journal of International Account Research, and Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes. Uh, she's also received multiple awards from academic conferences for the excellence of these papers, um, in addition to the multiple awards that she's received for excellence in teaching and faculty service from both the Graduate School of Management here at UCI as well as the university as a whole. Um, from but a short conversation with Dr. Ho, it is immediately apparent the intensity with which she cares about her students. For example, uh, when Claire and I met with her back in November, she was preparing to host a Thanksgiving dinner for anybody who wanted to come, was expecting at least like 80, I think, <laughs> former <laughs> students and current students um, to attend. And you know, the world would be a much happier place if everyone cared that much about you know, making the people's lives around them better. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ho. Uh, thanks, uh, Rebecca, for this warm introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jonathan, Claire, John, and also the organizing committee for the invitation. And uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for being here. And I'm glad, okay, the sun came out this morning. I really worried last yesterday. And uh, this is really my honor to be part of this faculty and uh, staff series which is uh, so valuable because it showcases so many different uh, personal journeys. And uh, Professor Abe Lee from the Biomedical Engineering was a speaker last uh, November. And uh, while Abe is also of uh, Taiwanese descent, our journeys are quite uh, different. So I hope to bring a different perspective to the table. During the family Christmas uh, uh, gathering, my daughter asked me what I was uh, 
you know, working on. So I told her, I said, I told them actually both, okay. And I said, oh, uh, I'm working on my WMMD talk. And they look at each other and say, you can imagine that a reaction, right? So after I explained to them what the WMMD talk were about, and they say, wow, people want to know about your journey. So I want to share with you about my story, my struggles, okay? And uh, not only as being an um, immigrant uh, Asian woman in academia, but also about my personal faith journey and uh, some events that have shaped my life. I know this is a difficult, but like other speakers, I will try to be as transparent okay, as possible. I hope me sharing my personal views and the challenges can be helpful to some of you. When I was uh, growing up in Taiwan, and Taiwan was, and still to a large extent, a very homogeneous society, I never encountered any diversity or uh, inclusion issues. Because uh, there, over 95% of the people are of the Han ethnic uh, uh, descent. And the only differentiating factor is whether your ancestor came to Taiwan hundreds of years ago, or they, came, they went over to Taiwan in the late 1940s, when the KMT retreated from China. My own family went over to, with the KMT because my father was in the military. And uh, in my entire family, maybe like some of you sitting here, I was the first one to have received a bachelor degree and uh, to, to go overseas to study and uh, to receive a PhD in, uh, you know, in accounting or in any degree, right? A PhD degree. So I can, during my use, I can generally state I never encounter any major setback and the belief I could control my own journey. So when I entered the elementary school, it, I was five, okay? Pretty young, and the, maybe the youngest in my peer group. And uh, in Taiwan, we have a different kind of school system. Every single advancement from elementary school to mid, junior high to junior high to high school to college and to graduate school, you have to take an entrance exam. Then based on your score, they, you know, they, they assign you to different schools. And I was very lucky. I passed the three entrance exams and uh, got into the undergrad the business administration program at the National Taiwan University, the top university in Taiwan. So through my, from my first grade all the way through my college, I received you know, several academic awards and, um, and finally, I also passed a very com uh, competitive uh, entrance exam to get into the MBA program at the, at the National Taiwan University. And just to give you an example, out of these hundreds of students sitting in the exam, only 14 of us were admitted to this MBA class, okay? Very competitive. So during my academic life, I can say, it quite a smoothly, okay, very smooth. And um, so I never thought about, uh, about the God or the religion. And in Taiwan, an overwhelming number of the population practiced uh, uh, Buddhism or the Taoism. And the other religions or other ways of thinking was not widespread. And uh, I remember during my college year, some student came to invite me to attend this uh, Christian group activity. To me, I think uh, Christianity is a really kind of foreign religion, okay, to me, okay, from the Chinese point of view. So I always try to find the excuses to decline the invitation in a nice way, not hurt their feeling, but I was always successful, never attend any of their activity. And my mother was a very devoted Buddhist. And even that, I did not go to temple with her. 
To me, religion was mere superstition, only needed by the weak and the old. Okay? So that was my perception about religion. But coming, coming uh, to the US really opened my eyes to diversity and also to new ideas. And yet, ironically, also to an array of the gender and the racially tinged the challenges. And it has brought uh, you know, me to, to uh, you know, really wrestle with identity that really pushed out of my comfort zone. And um, it, it is really kind of a challenge, OK? And it sometimes made me think about, because all of a sudden I realized I'm no longer part of the majority. I became minority. It's quite a challenge. And uh, when I went to Austin, Texas for my PhD, I never anticipate to encounter those kind of issues centered around the gender and the race. As I mentioned, Taiwan was a very homogeneous society, and the race was simply you know, not an issue. And even when I was in the MBA program, I was the only female student okay, in the class of 14. I did not encounter any different treatment. My guy classmates just treat me like one of them. We studied together, we competed, right? And also we hung out. That was really a fun time in my life. I really missed that, you know, that period of time. But in Austin, the accounting cohort consists of uh, 10 students, seven males, three females, and two white males, five South Korean males, and two African American females, and myself. And I quickly observed these five South Korean men. They stuck together, okay? And us did the two white males. These men seldom talk to me. I feel awkward, right? Because I used to be, you know, the only female student in the class. But, you know, we seldom talk to each other. I remember one time a Korean classmate asked me a question. Why you study accounting? At the time, Literally, I didn't know what the question about. This is from my background, okay? I thought, that, what's wrong? And he, he saw me paused. Then he went on to say, oh, in South Korea, and the women often, often study every like uh, home economics, music, and art, okay? And I was really stunned. I did not know how to respond. But over these uh, 30 years, I saw quite a few Korean women, okay, they study in the management, accounting, marketing, management information system. I feel really, really happy because it really kind of evolution in that society. And because of this, I really felt more comfortable to stick, you know, sticking with the two female classmates because they also were minority, right? They are very receptive. And we form an informal study group, okay? But at that time, I began to see while I could not be mainstream, I could support those who are on the fringe or those who are marginalized. That was my true feeling at the time. And even in my year, 33 years, actually, I mean 33 years, okay, more than 20 years, <laughs> 33 years in UCI, and uh, I made an effort to mentor other women. And also, I see my identity as an opportunity to aid those who are hampered in their opportunities. I believe this is another source of the pride in my work, which is uh, both you know, academic and also community-oriented. And um, so my time in Austin was a turning point at which I finally felt the need for God. I mentioned I have an informal study group with uh, Priscilla Slade and also uh, Shirley Freyer, okay? But uh, I often felt very lonely and stressed at being the only Asian woman in the PhD program, at least for the first two years. I was the only one, okay? And um, so, at, uh, and also my 
because I think at the time, most of Taiwanese female doctor students were either in the program of education or in the nursing. I was quite, uh, you know, isolated. Actually, the day in Austin, I really miss all my time back in Taiwan because, you know, I never have encountered any issue like this, right? No, not, not that kind of challenge. And um, uh, when I was in the PhD program, my husband was a PhD student in chemical engineering. We had to raise a two-year-old daughter. And uh, later on, two years later, we have a second daughter. So from the hindsight, I really think I have a great courage, okay, to do that. Because having two young children during that time was very challenging, as you can imagine. We both have to, you know, really need a big chunk of time to study or go to the lab to run the experiments. And the, the stress from all the aspects, the family, the schoolwork, and the finance, you know, really causes us to, you know, fight or, or argue often, okay? And um, so I realized my marriage was in deep trouble during my PhD time, uh, PhD years. And uh, our apartment in Austin really just across the street from <coughs> local church. So the pastor was really came over several times to invite us to attend the church service. And a group of uh, Christians also approaching us and they want to offer some opportunity to practice English conversation. You know, that is really appealing, right? To the non-native speaker, right? Somebody want to practice English with you without any charge, okay? <laughs> and uh, so I really admire those people, right? The Christian around me. And uh, I really could tell these uh, Christian, they had a re real joy and a peace. And uh, I, I saw their care and the love for others very genuine, not fake. They really want to do that without any kind of, a, you know, of payback. So that really made me start to think, well, I want to go to the church service to see why and how people can live lives of a joy and a peace, which was, I was lacking, okay? I was struggling with my, you know, the schoolwork and also the family responsibility. And um, even when I was seeking answers, I start to pray whenever I feel stressed or nervous. And these prayers indeed really soothe me and gave me peace and helped me through some very difficult times. Okay? So that was really my personal experience. And because of Christian's love and also my personal experience, I became less resistant to participate in Christian activities. And when I was in the job market back to the 1980s, and the job market for accounting PhD was very good. I received seven offers, okay? And definitely, you know, I, I, I accept the offer from UCI for two reasons. And the first reason is geographical location. It's very close to Asia, right? Los Angeles to Taipei, you know, that would be easier. And that would be easier for my parents to visit me and for us to go back to visit the family, the relative, and the friends. And the, the second reason was because a high percentage of the women faculty. And to my recollection, we have only 20 faculty who I interviewed. And the four of them are women. Judy Rosner, John Pierce, Mary Gilley, and also Robin Keller. They were strong leaders in the school. And uh, through my interview interaction with them, I feel really being supportive and really comfortable. And that, that kind of relationship made me decide this is the place I will, you know, I want to work. And as we speak today, I count in Mirage School, we have a 45 faculty. Guess how many women faculty we have? 23, 23, more than 50%. I believe this is the highest percent of women faculty in the country, if not in, I, I don't know, in the world, okay? But in the, in the research school, definitely we are the number one, okay? That kind of a statistic really make me proud of a Mirage school. 
And um, so it wasn't until our second year in Irvine that my husband and I received the Christ. Since then, we learned how to love each other. Our marriage was saved. And uh, as a matter of fact, we just celebrated our 39th anniversary 10 days ago. And my husband sitting here. <laughs> and we are looking for the you know, fourth one to speak a celebration, right? <laughs> and as an Asian woman faculty and a first generation immigrant, I encounter challenges in my early career in UCI. And I know some of the colleagues sitting here, my former students sitting here, as you may imagine, teaching at the MBA program is very challenging, especially for a non-native English speaker. And at the time, MBA student was generally against the bias against the woman faculty let alone such a petite Asian woman faculty, right? <laughs> I was the only Asian woman faculty you know, at the time. And uh, even though I really, honestly speaking, I was serious in my teaching. I spent hours and hours, double the time or triple the time as compared with my colleague, you know, they, they spent to prepare the, the class. But uh, I'm teaching accounting. As you know, accounting, debit credits, accounting <laughs> rules, right? Such a boring subject, right? <laughs> and I knew good Taiwanese or Chinese jokes, but I just was not able to crack good American jokes, <laughs> OK? And uh, I know my students felt my class was really kind of boring. Why? I, I would notice some you know, not paying attention. But keep in mind, in 1986, when I joined, we don't have an internet, right? No cell phone, otherwise they can play the game, right? Ignore you. <laughs> and I also noticed some students doing the puzzles in the newspaper. <laughs> and standing here, right? I know everybody, what, what they are doing. I was really discouraged, right? Even I really trying hard. And uh, another event was I, my first, okay, midterm exam. I spent hours putting the questions in the midterm and uh, really happy because I thought the questions are fair and really represent the materials being covered in class. And uh, guess what? After the student turning the midterm exam, one student cried in class. And she felt my test was too difficult, OK? And I was really shocked. If you see some was your student cry in class, OK, I didn't know how to deal with that. And uh, so because of my fr frustrating with my teaching, and I started to pray for my class, for my students. And I began to notice my interaction with the student became more positive and enjoyable after I started praying. Okay? And that was really kind of an experience. But I'd like to encourage those who are here, particularly the young people, once you overcome difficulties in life, you have to have very positive attitude to deal with that. Okay? And uh, later on, I received the uh, school level outstanding teaching awards twice, and uh, one campus level teaching award once. And by the sense, you know, we have a very award you know, co uh, winning colleague sitting here. And uh, so it's difficult for us to compete with young people now. Okay? <laughs> And uh, so, but I think uh, this is really, but uh, what really encouraged me was I have received numerous praises from my MBA students of my teaching style and my sense of humor, okay? <laughs> so that part particularly make me happy, right? I was such a boring class, but now I have a sense of humor, okay? And another, another setback in my challenge I encountered in my career was my tenure promotion. And um, one of the main reasons I had a difficult time receiving my tenure promotion was because my research area focusing on behavioral accounting, not the mainstream. 
And uh, although a great majority of faculty supported my tenure case, I received a preliminary denial decision letter from executive vice chancellor. Okay. That was really a major setback in my career. And after meeting with the, and the one of the reasons, uh, one of the reason was, okay, the former dean did not like my research area. So after meeting with the dean, I went back to my office, I closed the door, and I prayed to God for his grace. And God uh, comforted me with um, Isaiah 41.10. I just want to share with you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I was very grateful. Sorry. I was very grateful to have uh, several supportive colleagues. And they wrote a collected letter to the dean, indicate their support for my tenure case. And after reading my petition letter, pointed out some factual errors by the, by the former dean, and also the, this is a supportive letter from my senior colleagues. The dean changed his mind and wrote a letter to the EVC indicating his support for my tenure. Okay, so here I am. Okay, and uh, so after my setback in my tenure promotion, I have received every merit promotion on time ever since. And through my tenure promotion, God taught me the fact that I cannot control my own journey. And also taught me the lesson on humility. And as James 4, 6 states, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. In my experience with God in my marriage and also in my academic uh, uh, life, okay, and has uh, compelled me to help others so that their lives can be changed as mine was changed. And the one way I had hoped to help others was through campus ministry, and in which I, we, I have been involved with over the past 24 years. And in 1993, a, P a physics PhD student, Andrew Penn, and I started this fellowship, a campus fellowship for Chinese, uh, Taiwanese visitors, uh, students, and their family. And uh, our goal was simply to introduce these Mandarin-speaking students and the visitors to Christianity. And we like to help them to settle down and also to and, uh, re really kind of adapt to the American culture. We would pick them up at Los Angeles airport, no charge, okay, and find them a temporary place to stay, open up a bank accounts, or teach them how to drive, so on and so forth, okay. And um, thousands of the students, the visitors, the families that attend this fellowship, after, 20, uh, after two decades, and the group have grown very, very rapidly to the point we have had to separate the group into two. So I have witnessed the change in people's life and also God's abundant provision. And God was amazing. Really sent quite a few these co-workers, the students, the staff, and also the faculty, and, the, in, and also the full-time minister to the group. So that is really kind of a, a, our campus work. And I really appreciate even my husband is not uh, working at UCI. Over these 24 years, he gave a full support, OK? And he retired. He just gave all the time and energy to support his uh, 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 campus uh, uh, ministry. And I was uh, also very grateful to serve as equity advisor for the Mirage School for three years. And that is really, really good program, okay? I really have to say UCI really, uh, you know, make the very good achievement in this in diversity and the inclusion. That position really gave me the, you know, really helped me to officially help those uh, junior faculty and the women faculty with children, okay? 
And because my personal experience in the PhD program, and it really make me feel compelled to wholeheartedly to help the international students and the minority students, because I was one of them. And uh, because I prepared this uh, talk, I just you know, watched other recorded lectures. In a w WMMD speech, Dr. Kenneth Chen mentioned, he interviewed many people at the end of their life. He never, hear, he never heard, heard okay, anyone saying, I wish I work harder. I wish I published more papers, right? That is what we all you know, really work hard you know, for. And sometimes, you know, after you pass a certain age, I often ask myself what I want to be remembered after I leave, retire from UCI, or I leave this world. Sooner or later, we all will do, right? And I don't think people remember how many top tier accounting management articles I've published. Even I enjoy doing that, right? But um, I think my legacy will be how the Lord has used me at UCI to help change lives and the perspective of people who I have had the privilege of knowing. And uh, I know it will be a few years before I retire from UCI. I will continue learning my lesson on humility. I cannot control my own journey. That is a big lesson I learned. And also, I will continue to help the young people through different channels and make some influence in campus. Thank you very much. OK, now we have some time for uh, some questions. So uh, John and Debbie have the microphones. I know you all can probably speak very loudly, but for the uh, questions to be heard on the video, please wait for the microphone. So, anybody? That's a good sign, no question, right? <laughs> I wish my student had said no question. <laughs> no, thank you. That was a very nice talk. Um, so you mentioned that you um, were not religious in your childhood, but your mother was very devoutly Buddhist. So I was wondering how your family took your conversion story. Oh. How did they react to it? Okay. Uh, my family, my parents actually are very open-minded. Okay. And if I, you may say, oh, how? Let me give you an example. I mentioned Taiwan was a very homogeneous society. However, we have a two different kinds of a Taiwanese. One is the ancestor from mainland China hundreds of years ago, like my husband. Okay? They call them native Taiwanese. And my family is the one came over with the KMT in 1949. And still have lots of the culture, the language gap. Even we still you know, have the same ethnicity descent, but it was still different. And at the time, those native Taiwanese, they marry among themselves. And uh, all this uh, com uh, family com came over from China after 1949 and trying to stick together another group. But my, when my parents knew I was dating a native Taiwanese, OK, they did not say stop or, you know, and the, the, actually, the parents in Taiwan is very authoritative. It's not like here, your daughter tell you, I'm going to marry John. So, oh, I bless you, right? <laughs> no, you always have an opinion about things, OK? No, you know, you're trying to stop and do it. But my, my, fam, my, my, my parents were really kind of open. So, oh, OK, as long as you, you know, think this is good. And the, the same thing as a religion. My mother went to temple almost uh, pretty often. Every first 15, and she become like a vegetarian because she just, you know, not eat anything meat, okay? She really practiced very strictly, but she never interfered me with any religion. She just said, okay, good. And the side story, when we were in Austin, my, my mother came, and we have no place for her to worship to put the scent. So 
we went to the local grocery market to buy a Buddha, you know, the, the, the picture, which is broken one. And we just brought home and said, well, once you are sincere, and it, it is good, OK? It doesn't matter if it's broken picture or not. <laughs> and so she just, she just worshiped there, OK? And um, I think uh, she really, and, but uh, the, the good story was, when she came to the, uh, California back to the 1990s, and she also converted to Christianity. Because she knew that's a real peace and she had. Because she got this kind of anxiety issue and worry, always worry about things. Even she, you know, like worship and pray for her God, you know, didn't work. So she just convert. So I did not any encounter any struggle while I decided to receive, uh, you know, Christ. Hi, Professor. Hi. Um, you kind of touched upon your experience as a woman in a male-dominated industry and how you kind of struggled in the beginning as an Asian woman to kind of command authority. Um, could you speak a little bit more about, you know, your personal, like, strategy on how to overcome that <laughs> and, and okay. what you did as a woman leader um, okay. specifically? That's a good question. Okay, excellent question. And as I mentioned, why I interview schools, Columbia, Colorado, you know, many schools, and I really feel wherever I feel comfortable. It's kind of your instinct, right? And I came to Irvine interview, I really feel, wow, we are really, you know, working the park, right? The, at, the, at the time, uh, our school is really in the social science tower, the third, of, the third floor, just one floor, okay? Not really in the Mirage school now. And the faculty interactions I mentioned, you know, I interview, talk uh, with uh, John Pierce and also Mary Gilly. They both are very, very encouraging and they feel like the role model, okay? And they can fight for you. You don't have really stick out, right? Fight with the guy, right? So that is a uh, one thing. And Robin Keller, when I, I remember I had the dinner with her, she's really kind of cheerleader type, okay? Really encouraging for everything. And I feel this is a place I really want to come because I can be nourished. And I don't have to worry about this kind of a unpleasant things I encounter when I was in the PhD program. So that really very important to me, okay? But I think uh, from the other aspect about how to deal with the main dominant uh, organization, I think you really have to speak up for yourself. And my experience is if you really being shy, okay, trying to be compromising everything, and your voice will not be heard, okay? And uh, that we really, because of from, coming from my culture, and uh, we are very trying to be uh, very homo uh, homo harmonious with everyone, right? We don't want to fight, there's peace and here and there, and uh, submission to the authority, whoever, you know, superior to me. That is the kind of culture I grew up. So in my first uh, seven years, six years in the graduate school management, and I always lock the door in my office. I don't interact with people. And people say, oh, I think you have a, people will not vote for you because you don't have to drink a beer with them, you know, so those kind of things. But I just feel I don't have time. Right? I have two kids. I really have to focus on this and th that. And I just believe, OK? Whatever, I can really try my best and work hard, and uh, it will show. But uh, actually, I think that sometimes you have to make people feel not easy can defeat you. That is my experience. Particularly, I only mentioned very briefly about, uh, I wrote a petition letter for my preliminary tenure denial decision. And that time really strengthened me internally because I pray a lot. And also show me I really cannot accept everything to me, happen to me. So that's the reason I wrote the 15 pages, okay, single space <laughs> responses. So yeah, you can imagine, right? And uh, so I, uh, you know, analyze about the things, and that's the reason I changed my things uh, uh, mind. I really appreciate, okay, and uh, for his changing his mind. Otherwise, I don't know where I am now, okay. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, Professor. I don't have a question, but I do want to say thank you. Um, my life has changed for the better because I know you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you for taking a chance on a small little girl 25 years ago. Thank you, thank you. And actually, I think uh, knowing Tui, okay, Niwai, was a really a blessing. When she was in the undergrad program, the, I, think a, uh, soft, uh, I think a freshman, right? So I interviewed the work study student. And uh, among the six or five, I forgot, I picked pick her, okay? I think uh, she was uh, good. And uh, so we have uh, some kind of very good communication because uh, I asked uh, Tui, are you a student at UCI or are you, are you a customer at UCI, okay? The reason my daughter at the time was in Pomona College, she always viewed she is a customer, okay? And that really prompted me to say, hey, why students view themselves as a customer, right? And because they pay, right? They pay a lot, right, for the private tuition. So I asked Tui and have better understanding from her perspective about uh, she's also the first generation okay, immigrant here, and she worked hard. And uh, people in my school are so smart. Immediately, the second quarter, okay, she disappeared because they recruit her to the human resources department, and now she's the human resources department head in the Marathi school. Okay, we all rely on Tui. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned that when you were studying, you were going for your PhD program, that you have your daughter was little, and I, we, as parents, we all know that the the story doesn't stop there. Once they grow up, you still have, um, you still continue have to balance between work and work in private life. So, as a mother of a five year old and ten years old, I like to have your advice about how do you balance your life, your private life, while you pursue your professional life? Okay, excellent question. I think from hindsight, everything seems to be easier, right? And once you're struggling in the everyday daily life, okay, you really have to deal with that because you only have 24 hours sleeping and also doing things. You don't have too much time left. Let me share with you one personal experience. And uh, my daughter, when she was in the elementary school, and uh, she always thought about mom was so busy. And she did not tell me about uh, parents' volunteer request by the teacher, right? Until, I, I, you know, you always have a parent, a teacher, this kind of a conference. And uh, the teacher said, oh, uh, you know, we need someone work to help the, the classroom. And uh, meaning you did not participate. I didn't know, right? And I, you know, I did not go through the elementary school system here in Taiwan. No parents participate in this kind of grading <laughs> things, right? And I said, oh, I didn't know. And my daughter never told me. So I asked her, and her response was, I thought you were too busy. You don't have time. It made me feel really guilt, right? And another thing she mentioned, she asked me, how come Susan's mom always bring them to the park? We never go to the park. That really, really made me feel guilt, okay? And my response at the time was, oh, I have no time. Oh, uh, I had to work and I have to sleep, you know, I don't have time to go to park. You know, now she has uh, two boys, three and five. They live in Hong Kong, okay? When she was working in the, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, every day, every lunch, she bring her son to the park every day, okay? <laughs> and every time I heard that, it's kind of really like heard here, <laughs> right? Because yeah, I only have this much of time, right? I think I just told, talked to them, chatted with them during the Christmas break, or they, they all came back, okay? I told my two daughters, I said, well, you have to know, I was really busy, I have no time, I already give everyone my possible time, and my parents was, were living with me, they needed to go to the doctor, you know, send to the school and this, and I have no recreation at all. I didn't know what is recreation, right? So that is kind of challenge of life I have, but my husband, I have to say, he's so supportive, even though he had to work in Anaheim. I'm the one major 
pick up and just drive and go to the classroom. Okay, I, I thought I already did enough. But from my daughter's point of view, she observed I was busy. Okay, she did not mention the teacher's request to go to school to help. So I think uh, once she gradually, you know, uh, grow up and she realized, and I think it's very funny, when she was in the second, uh, first year in Kona College, one time she came back, she said, oh, now I know you are a professor. I'm kind of like, never changed my job, right? <laughs> so from day one, I'm, I was a professor, right? <laughs> and she now says, oh, now I have to make appointment to see professor. Okay, and she did not know the difference. She just feel like, okay, you are very busy, and uh, now I hope she can better understand. Because being she's a, she was also a professional, but in Hong Kong you you have good you know domestic help at home, right? It's not like me just doing everything. Okay, cooking, driving, you know all the things I had to do by myself, right? So that's really a challenge. And I think that everyone just trying, you, you can try to find the balance. You cannot be everything the best. You always have a short on something. This you had to recognize in the very beginning, right? Once you choose this career. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's, I'm really touched uh, by your journey. And um, I wouldn't say uh, I have very similar, but I have can relate to your experience. Um, I have a question. You mentioned when you first start teaching, uh, people think your class was boring. And later, they think it was uh, funny or interesting. Um, I wonder whether you can share some tips, uh, especially for people, <laughs> you know, English is not their first language. How can they make their, you know, uh, lecture or whatever presentation mm -hmm. being more interesting? Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very excellent question. I think uh, once you are tense in classroom, student can tell right away. You cannot pretend, right? And people just view, because you can imagine, the first semester, a quarter, I was here, and I tried to be like, oh, I'm professional, right? Very professor type. But uh, many MBA students sitting there, some of them are older than me, <laughs> right? But now, once you're getting older, you win that kind of authority, right, Darren? <laughs> He was uh, in my class before, okay. And I think that is one aging, age is kind of factor. Once you're too young, people just think, do you know, really know your stuff, right? And uh, even before I got my promotion, tenure promotion, I think every class, every class for the first one, first class, I expect a student will challenge me with all kind of questions. They just want you to prove you know your stuff, right? But if I can pass the test in the first class, then the second class and the remaining 10 classes become smooth. If you really have a trouble okay, in the first class or you cannot answer and to their satisfaction, then you got the trouble for the entire quarter. But I think over time, I'm more relaxed myself, right? And I can more crack, more better American jokes, right? <laughs> at the time, I really don't know, right? I'm kind of like, if I say something, they feel like, you know, they look at me like, this is not funny, right? <laughs> so make you feel like I'm not going to say anything <laughs> about the jokes. So I think it's kind of mutual. But as I mentioned, I, I began to see the change, my relationship with the students, and because I started praying. I really nervous, okay? Even I spend hours and hours make the preparation, everything. But you know, you still, once they showing some face in the, then you immediately like, you know, stuck, right? So I think a praying really kind of soothes me and give me lots of the peace. And uh, I, I don't know why, you know, I'm just uh, I can give a lecture more smoothly. Yeah, I think uh, maybe part of because of me, right? And this is a two way communication. It's not only like one way. So maybe for, from this kind of a, a tape the recording would be better because you don't face any face, right? Just talk. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, I want to ask you about earlier, you say that um, make sure that our voice are heard, mm -hmm. especially because we're women. Have you ever felt like you're being too aggressive, that you want to hold yourself back? 
um, because I feel like maybe my aggressiveness is can be annoying sometimes, and mm -hmm. I don't want to show it too much. So, is there a line? It, should we ever stop yeah. fighting for or doing what we really want? I would say this is kind of art, right? It's not like a science where to stop, right? So I think uh, try not to be very like timid. People can tell right away, right? But I think uh, everything, once you prepare yourself for the meeting and people see you make the points, good points, right? Even sometimes you only speak once a while, they know you are a good thinker and that you can contribute. But I think uh, once you respond in a very polite way, I think no matter w what kind of culture and environment, people appreciate this uh, politeness, right? You ha we have to show, res you know, re express yourself in a respectable way. People can really appreciate that. And, uh, but I think uh, being the first uh, generation immigrant, especially I'm deeply influenced by the Chinese uh, culture, and we try not to say things. Okay, we know, but we hide here. Okay, when the test, it can show. I know, right? <laughs> but most of the time, you know, I'm not open up, and uh, so you have to adapt to the American culture. But if you are really talkative, I can also see some colleagues really like, you know, everybody will look the, look at, you know, give an eye, right? So you can sense where to stop. I think it's kind of an art. I really cannot give you more detailed guideline. Sorry. <laughs> Be a faculty in academia. Oh, okay. Um, since I was young, I really want to play the game. Okay, people are the students. I'm the teacher. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I really like that game, right? And they say, "Oh, you will sit there." Okay, I'm teaching you this and that, right? And uh, the entrance exam really showing because, uh, and, and then I chose business administration because in Taiwan we have uh, four areas you can choose. Okay. Medical science and the, you know those kind of science, engineering and also the uh, the art, the English literature, and then that is a business and social science. So I chose a business and social science. But even when I was in the college, I really admire professors. I really show great respect, look up to them. Right? So, wow, professor, right? So I really dream, always want to be teacher. And uh, after I graduate from the MBA degree, and I didn't go to work, didn't go to the bank or, and go to any other you know, company to work, I decided to pursue my academic uh, career. So that's the reason I came to the US and study accounting. From hindsight, I really think I made the best choice. <laughs> really, and uh, we have the 40th anniversary for the college reunion, and uh, my, my classmates always say, wow, you make a good choice, now you're a professor, and make me really feel happy, right? <laughs> and the plus, I really, I really think this kind of position can have an influence to the young people, right? Not only the classroom knowledge, but also you can have the chance to help them change life and also the perspective. Yeah, so I'm really happy about my choice being a professor. Yeah. Thank you.